this is the event number 11 out of 21. Oh, we've got a very cold, uh, cold Cambridge um, saying hello to everyone. It's very cold in, um, in Wales as well. Um, I've invited along um, um, four, four people who are facilitators of groups within the DEEP network who are all very, very different. And um, we are hoping to find it, kind of capture some of the sort of top tips for facilitating groups. One of the most frequent questions I get is, is about um, how to start a group and how to support a DEEP group as well. Um, we've had 17 Oh, good morning from a cold out of Hebrides too. Um, we've had um, 17 in-person events uh, across the UK over the last year, celebrating 10 years of deep. And um, we very much wanted to make sure that as many people as possible within the network can access um, some, some of the joy of the celebrations and also the, the whole ethos of sharing, learning and supporting as well. Um, all of the films will be um, available to watch, the recordings will be available to watch, um, <laughs> competing with the dog in the background. So I'm going to hand over for introductions and do a bit of muting. And I'm hoping that it's all the Christmas cards are being delivered in several post bags. So um, first of all, can I hand over to uh, Ruth? Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ruth and I work up in Fife in Scotland and it's pretty chilly here too. And I support the peer support group called Stand. Hello, hi, I'm George from North Shropshire and I uh, facilitate a deep group um, based in Shrewsbury, although we have people coming from Telford and, and further afield, uh, even Stafford occasionally. Um, and we, we also do weekly Zooms. So we do face-to-face -face once a month and weekly Zoom meetings. Um, and I've been doing that for, well, I set it up a, about two or three years before COVID. Um, so five, six years now. That's Thank me. you, George. And um, if you don't mind me saying so, George is one of the several facilitators within the Deep Network who also live with dementia as well. Um, so thank you for being with us today, George. And um, Danny. Uh, hi, I'm Danny, and I support the Sunshiners group in Kent. Yeah, I've been doing so now for four years. It's just come up to the anniversary for me, so yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Danny. And Danny was one of the facilitators who hosted a, um, a big event down in Kent uh, at the beginning of September. And I forgot to mention that Ruth and Stan uh, hosted a big event too as well. Um, Damien. Hi, I'm Damien Murphy. I am here in York and I help facilitate York Minds and Voices and also the East Riders Group in the East of Yorkshire. Thank you very much indeed. I'd be all pleased to know that the postman has now gone. Um, we will be using um, these, uh, oh, see my, <laughs> the blurry, I want to speak to these cards um, to take sort of uh, turns, which always works really well on Zoom and in person at meetings as well. Um, so um, we had, after the first lockdown in September 2021, we had a facilitators gathering in Woodbrook, which was kind of, we, we framed it as a bit of a kind of a recover and regenerate and recuperation kind of session, but it also create, brought about this fantastic resource of top tips for facilitators, which is available to download on the DEEP website. Um, so we're kind of picking up on some of the themes from this resource and I, I highly recommend that you, you go to that resource and have a, have a read of it. Um, but some of the discussion points that um, we, um, we want to discuss today were, um, you know, the sort of what makes the deep groups um, unique, what is the, what is the what's, you, what's different about the deep groups and, you know, thinking about the values base and the fundamental essence of um, deep groups. So who would like to start with that? Um, George. Yep. Used to, I'm usually happy to put my foot in first. I'm sure. Um, so, um, yeah, what makes deep groups different from any other groups? The, the deep values um, probably define it best of all. Um, but basically, 
a deep group is a group of people meeting together socially, basically. And they are for people with dementia, primarily. And they're, they are, what they do is decided by the people there, not by some facilitator. Uh, I mean, you know, speaking for myself as a facilitator, I, I'll go along with suggestions, but they are a very democratic lot and they, uh, they will only do things if, that they want to do. And they will often raise things as well. Um, so it's, it's about, yeah, I'll come back to the values. It's about being a safe environment to, to belong. It's about encompassing safety, belonging and unity. And it's about deep members treating each other with kindness and respect and listening. So for me, that sums up what a deep group is. A great social engagement and opportunity to support each other. Thank you very much, George. Ruth. I think for me, the, the uniqueness of the deep groups is that there's a kind of, they're based on people's, you know, desire to get involved and be connected. You know, that's the kind of underpinning thing. So, and that they're kind of based on the assumption that people can, people will, people mm -hmm. want to, and it's a very active form of engagement. It's not the kind of passive sitting there being entertained. I mean, the kind of stuff that we've done, in my experience of being involved in health and social care for the best part of 40 years, is actually, the, the, like, for example, the work that we're doing with the musician. I've never experienced a piece of work mm -hmm. like that before. You know, the, the work that we did with Damien and Stan to create the Good Life course, I've never experienced that before, despite all these years. So there's something about that hugely assuming that people can, people will, and people will back off if they don't want to. And it's that kind of sense of, you know, just getting that kind of, putting the opportunities in front of people and seeing who picks it up and runs with it. Mm. And it's based on courage and, um, you know, that kind of sense of trying something different, you know, putting yourself out there, um, you know, being exposed to new experiences and thinking, well, actually that wasn't so bad or that was absolutely hugely powerful. Mm. Thank you, Ruth. So, Danny, I know that um, when we've talked previously, you talked about that sense of um, a leap of faith, and obviously, as a uh, um, as a clinical psychologist, you you are in your foot is in two camps in a way. So, you spoke about this leap of faith. Yeah, I guess for me. The deep group is about empowering our service users um, to have a voice to uh, and, and I guess I'm going to kind of seep into the next part really which is a facilitator is someone who turns up the volume of that voice hmm. um, and doesn't really do an awful lot else to be fair <laughs> um, we're just there to support they tell us what we need and for me it is sometimes uh difficult being that I work in the NHS um and so I do kind of have the the dual role uh shall we say but then they do complement one another because it means that whatever they bring to to us means that we can then help support that change um and vice versa it means that when we change our services we can involve them uh to ask what their opinions are and to get them involved in in helping us to modify and get that right um so yeah a dual role <laughs> time limited um at times but i think in general uh it creates for a better service for both them and and for us thank you danny it's it's interesting that um the groups in kent of which you're part on or are supported by the um health trust and um and I just and and the funding comes from this whole kind of service user movement. And so you describe the people as service users, whereas I know a lot of people in other groups kind of really balk away from being described as service users. Um, I I wondered how um, how people within the group do you feel that they treat you differently because they also know that you're their psychologist. <laughs> So we do try to, um, shall we? Oh, 
can't hear you, Danny. They keep those things separate. It doesn't always work that way. Oh, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Odd. Um, I was just saying, um, I think we do our best to try and make sure that the two are separate because I don't feel that I, I wouldn't want one of my sunshiners coming in and feeling awkward because they know that I know something in their personal life and they're worried about me, I don't know, mm-hmm. spilling the beans or, or whatever it is, although you are bound to confidentiality, of course. Um, that said, it has sometimes spilled over, but it does enable our sunshiners to also come up with difficulties um, that they might have and get that clinical advice in in quite a nice environment and I guess when we talk about services and coming through sort of the memory clinic or getting a diagnosis of dementia quite often there are frustrations right that things weren't done quick enough or that there was too much information given and it wasn't relevant but um, I guess working in both fields means that we're able to explain why that is Um, and they're able to say okay well what about if we and then we kind of compromise and meet in the middle and find something that works for everyone which I think is really beneficial and they have they've massively recreated uh, some of our memory clinic pathways and and we found gaps um, in terms of you know how do we explain this to children and so our sunshiners have recently developed some storybooks for different age ranges for children. Um, and it's not always nan or granddad who's got dementia. Sometimes it's just an aunt or an uncle or a sister or whoever it might be to show that that isn't, you know, it's not, it doesn't just happen for older people. It happens no matter what your age is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think, it, yeah, it's a challenge in, at, at times uh, in terms of sort of, you want to give more time than sometimes you can um so it does sometimes mean that it can it can spill over but generally the two do complement one another thank you i guess it sounds like you're in a position to be able to carry a lot of the things through uh, which is quite a unique position i think for many uh, groups for some have someone with that power if you like but also i i was thinking about a lady who um who is a dementia support worker, who is a dementia support worker to the people who are within the group. And she said that after the group, she always comes away with a kind of a a long list of things to do. And um, and I, so so my sort of feedback to her was that um, in a way she needs to leave that role at the door um, because a lot of the groups are about finding solutions together and amongst themselves. So kind of, so I guess it's quite difficult to remove that identity of, of who you are from the group so the group can flourish within its own right. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, Damien. Uh, interesting you you use the word flourish there, Rachel. I was going to say that. Um, uh, it is, it's a, you know, and, and also picking up on what George said about those values and you mentioned belonging two or three times and welcome. Um, when we showed the video of the Minds and Voices group, I think the word welcome came up three or four times in the first minute or so. And, and yeah, those values, belonging, welcome, and that safe space, I think, that you mentioned, George, that seem to be, I wouldn't say unique to deep, but, but um, you know, the, they're certainly universal across the network, you know, whichever groups you, you, you go to, you feel at home. And and people with dementia have grown in confidence because of that and said yes to things and said, you know, and been open to take part, as Ruth said, in all sorts of things. And I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges as a facilitator, I suppose, you know, and, and Danielle's talked about that as well, is, is the, uh, you know, the idea of letting go and saying, OK, yeah, almost stopping that inner gatekeeper, I think, that we've all got. Yeah. You know, and I, I know I certainly sort of thought, oh, is this person able to do that? Or sh- should we invite this person or can they? And actually just let it go, you know, and you get used to that handing mm-hmm. over. Um, and when you when you do, it's quite liberating and you see people flourish be- and people then say yes to so many things in the group. We had the artist Alan on on um, on our group um, session the other day talking about a project he did and he'd gone around other groups across York but he had no takers for his art project, yet he came to Minds and Voices and everyone was up for it straight away. <laughs> and, and it was that self-confidence. And I think that that's it's great. And when you, when you sort of ferment that sense of belonging, that safe space, 
you know, all those deep values, people do flourish and people do wonderful things. And, and um, yeah, and I think, that, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of me as a facilitator, not being a barrier, you know, and I think there's a difference between running a group and facilitating a group. And I always try to use the word facilitator rather than run. Um, yeah. Thank you. George. I just wanted to add that, um, I mean, there are one or two groups that have folded over the years for all sorts of reasons. But basically, I think members of deep groups come back for more all the time, the successful ones, and that's most of them, um, because it's the best form of support um, that, that we can find. Um, and, um, and that is, in a sense, it's proof. They just go on and on because people need them mm. and want them and enjoy them. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's very hard for some facilitators, especially if they're coming from organisations who have been running groups in a, what I'll call a different way. Um, I think it's very hard for them to step back um, at times. Oh dear, I've just got a phone call. Yeah. I'll be back in a moment, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Ruth, I wanted, to, um, I wanted to ask you about because you've been, um, you were employed by your local council as a, uh, a dementia-friendly um, kind of coordinator, was it? Yeah. And um, and I know that when you have been in the situation, the position of asking um, people who are part of the STAN group to take part in in anything, you've been very mindful about not uh, overloading people, but not but not being a gate a gatekeeper as well. I mean, it is hugely interesting, Rachel, because there is quite an element of risk in the whole thing. I mean, you know, you, you are conscious. I mean, when I first started out with the, you know, the person I met first in stand was Jerry, and he was one individual that I knew, and it was him who wanted to set up the group. So the nurse who supports them and myself, we, we've supported that process. And to be perfectly honest, I was being quite selfish because I kind of recognised that I was wearing Jerry out. You know, he was carrying my bags. He was being the sat nav all over the kingdom. And I'm thinking, God, this guy's going to be exhausted here. So setting up the group was really helpful for me because it meant I could draw on other people. But I suppose what I've really recognised out of it is how much they get out of doing the presentations. Um, I mean, we've recently been involved in schools and it's mostly Jerry and Irene who help with that. Sometimes Audrey, but mostly Jerry and Irene. And, you know, they get a real buzz of it. I mean, we sometimes have to be at the school at nine o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's a huge ask. You know, there's a bit of travel involved and yet they, they absolutely thrive on it. So I, I think that's what I mean about assuming that people can, that people want to and not, you know, stopping yourself from, you know, allowing them to do things. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of really quite inspiring. I mean, they, they would say that they're still alive and doing really well living with dementia because of all the experiences that they've had, whether it's doing dementia friends with me or the kind of stuff that we've had in the group. Um, you know, so from that point of view, there is, you know, that kind of, the word is flourishing. It's a really useful word because that's, I mean, they're, they're blooming, you know, in that sort of sense. And, you know, all the kind of memories that they're creating are so positive around the years that they're living really, really matter because what a difference they're making. And, you know, that kind of sense of, you know, the activism came sort of second hand, really, for us. It was more about kind of peer support and doing the kind of activities to, you know, promote well-being. And the activists came sort of at the back of that. So, but, you know, the people themselves get so much out of it. It's worth every bit of energy that you put into it. Um, and sometimes, as Danielle says, you know, it can be really quite complicated. I mean, you've got maybe a group where you've got a range of different needs in the group. So you're almost having kind of groups within groups, but actually that's where the peer support comes in and people naturally kind of match up. Um, and I think, it, you, you know, it's really worth it. It is really worth doing it because at the end of the day, you know that people are just getting such a lot out of it. So it's, it's really matters. And peer support, I believe, you know, now, as I say, after all these years in health and social care, that actually peer support's the way forward. You know, no offence, Danny, but good idea all the workers. <laughs> you know, just let them be, you know, with a wee bit gentle, you know, facilitation or whatever. 
you know, I was astonished to find out that people never paid any attention to what I said as a worker, but, you know, they'd listen to each other and they get that information and they do it. Do you know, it's quite upsetting really after all these years, but if that's the reality, then let's embrace it. You know, let's get on with it. <laughs> is there an element of having to leave your ego at the door as well as living your your professional door as well? Oh dear. Well, I never really had much of an ego, Rachel, but, you know, I think <laughs> there's certainly something about you know, it, there's a kind of real mutuality about it. There's a real kind of levelling about it. If you really open yourself up to the whole experience, it is about truly getting alongside people and going at their pace, you know, not driving it from your agenda. I mean, I was very, very lucky to meet Stan because it's really helped me with my work, mm. you know, my main job. But actually, I've got, you know, hopefully I've given as much back as they've given to me. You know, mm. hopefully that that's the case. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to reiterate really what, what Ruth said about that sort of groups becoming activists. It, it sort of flows very, very naturally from that sense of belonging, from that confidence, from those conversations that people have. And then people in those conversations, there might be a question. Well, is that fair? Does that happen to you? Should we ask about that? And suddenly you're challenging people or people are coming to you to find out more about your point of view because, you know, over the time you've gained a reputation for being able to have a say, you know? Um, and it's just, yeah, I think, I suppose our role of facilitators, as Danny said, is, is, is giving a little bit of volume to, to those voices. Um, you know, so that's very much the, the, um, the, 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 the way I think to go. And yeah, it, it flowed quite naturally and people have gained that confidence and are banging the table. And yesterday with, with a couple of members of the East Riders group, I was at the County Hall in Beverly. Uh, we were reporting to the, what, this a very fancy name, Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Councillors who, who are basically saying, well, what are you doing with our money? To, to all the sort of the commissioners. And they presented a very long report with lots of jargon and, and words like co-production repeated about 82 times, I believe. <laughs> but two members of Minds and Voice um, of East Riders came along and just said how it was their experience of being part of the group and, and going on, a, on the good life course, in fact. And and they just blew the blew everybody away. The whole council were just blown away and and um and they said, well, you've, you've brought this really incomprehensible report to life, you know, and we want more of this and we want this to continue. And and the guys, you know, and I, I texted to say thank you, you know, and, and one chap replied, you know, oh, it's just, you know, it's great to feel important and have that role again, because obviously that's been compromised with the dementia and it shouldn't necessarily so be so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Damien. George. I, I just want to pick up on something that Damien said. And if this has already been, if anything I say now has already been said while I was on the phone, sorry, um, <laughs> stop me. Um, Wouldn't dare. Um, oh God, what was I going to say? Um, oh yeah, jargon. I uh, what, <laughs> deep groups are very good at busting jargon, um, and and those who use it. Um, and it's interesting that that we we do tend to have a have a way of of reducing those in hierarchical positions down to our level, which is not down at all, but it is it is away from obfuscation and irritating jargon um, and just do it, please, do it, you know. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things about it. We, we don't have, we don't tend to have pretensions because we've, we've left them behind when we come to the deep group. We just, we just ourselves, and um, and we trust each other. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Danny. I was just going to say, I think that's definitely one of the challenges of having a dual role and being in the NHS and working with a deep group, just because <laughs> the NHS is full of jargon, mm. absolutely full of it. Um, we break everything down into totally new words. Um, and I mean, I'm dyslexic. So for me, starting the NHS, it was the most confusing thing ever. Um, so I try to be very aware of it, but it does become quite a normal sort of language to use. Um, so uh, I remember speaking to Rachel after our, <laughs> our Sunshiners uh, day that we had had as one of the, the deep 
uh, anniversary days and uh, she has given me a jargon jar um, <laughs> which is supposed to sit and help to remind us really um, I mean our sunshine is a brilliant at, at picking it apart but yeah definitely one of the challenges and I, and I suppose as well that I think Danny's frozen but um, one of the one of the challenges is that um, is about feeling comfortable within your group to challenge the facilitator to say actually go back and you know put a put a pound in the jargon jar because actually we don't understand the word you're saying and I think it's um I think one of the beauties of the of the jargon jar challenge is that it slows it slows your processing down as a professional to the level that actually you need to slow down to actually be able to be you know understood and followed by everyone within the group as well and we mentioned earlier, George. And using these cards in ordinary meetings, if you're a member of a deep group and you get invited to a council or a, a health authority or something group, um, take some cards along if you've got them and, and say, could you use these please? Because it helps me to, because it slows everybody down. Mm, it's great. Yeah. yeah. And um, um, I, I was thinking about picking up on the, um, the, the trust that um, we were talking about within the group. And I think that, um, you know, with any group of people in life, there are going to be people who don't necessarily like each other, don't get on. I guess, what, what would you say as facilitators, have you had any kind of challenges in the groups where you've needed to kind of intervene and step in or to, or what, or what strategies can that you have in place which kind of re mm. can reduce that, that stress? <clears throat> So I think, I think the one that I would suggest, uh, you know, offer is, I, I mean, I said earlier on that primarily deep groups are for, for people with dementia, but inevitably some, some do include carers. Um, and, and then maybe what, what we do is we, we, we will split after a few minutes and they'll have their meeting somewhere else and we'll have ours. Um, and I made a mistake recently and, uh, and I, I just wasn't feeling particularly well. Um, and I, I just let it run and the carer stayed with us. And one carer, I hope he's not watching us, but if he is, <laughs> you know who you are, <laughs> um, did dominate a bit. And, um, and we, you do have to watch out for that. Um, and that's the beauty of splitting because you know carers get used to talking for their loved one um, or their friend or whoever it is um, and they they dis they disable people without meaning to with the best of intentions but they do sometimes so it's good to separate away and I'll tell you what you soon see people who have been slightly disabled become enabled again when they're away and they'll, you know, we had a lady, I often quote this, an old, uh, elderly lady with dementia, quite far on. And um, after one meeting where her husband stayed, he, uh, I persuaded him not to come the next time because he didn't need to. And he was happy. Uh, and she immediately started to order coffees that she wanted, which were not the ones that he always ordered, and to have put loads and loads of brown sugar in, in her coffee, which he, she, he wouldn't let her do. And she just, you know, she, she blossomed, she flourished. <clears throat> Thank you. It's, it's interesting, George, that you went immediately for the kind of the, the source of um, tension in the group maybe being a carer. And I think that, um, you know, there are some groups where carers are, you know, incredibly integral and important part of the group and, oh, it's sure. very, and it works very successfully yeah. but if we continue on the the carers being part of groups and come to Ruth I mean, what's happened in our situation, Rachel, we're a bit like George, so sometimes we're all together, sometimes we split. Um, and I think it is really important that people with dementia get that chance to find their own voice. We find that absolutely crucial because like George, you'll often find that people are talked over or whatever. Um, we haven't had a lot of problems about group dynamics. We did have one situation where there were one couple and it was unfortunately particularly the carer 
who was quite destructive in her um, dialogue with other group members. Um, and she, they actually, you know, disappeared from the group quite naturally. We didn't, I mean, we were at the stage mm. where we thought we're going to have to intervene here, but actually they just disappeared. And I think what happened there was the group themselves kind of almost eased them out because people wouldn't listen. You know, people weren't responding to the sort of stuff that she was talking about. Um, so from that point of view, they sort of disconnected with us. And thankfully, they found another group where they felt much more able to be connected there. Um, so we haven't had a lot of problems. I think the diversity of the group and, you know, you get like we, you know, sections that are maybe more comfortable with each other or whatever. But again, because of the different activities and stuff that we support people to do, then there's a kind of collective so it's almost like you've got a big group, you've got small groups within groups, and then that opportunity to split really works quite well with people. Um, and now we've got some paid carers coming into the groups with people as they get more unwell and they're even driven to places and stuff like that. And actually that's been hugely helpful because they're learning a huge amount from us, um, mm. you know, in relation to what their person with dementia can actually do and stuff, you know. So they're seeing a hugely different side of people. So. Mm. Uh, you know, there's there's swings around about it, but I say we haven't had a huge amount of problems with it, um, thankfully, um, and hopefully that will continue. But I think that's about the the sort of scene that you set. It's about the conditions that you create. You know, mm. as Damien says, you know, George said as well. You know, you're creating a safe place. So well, if people don't feel safe because of some of the dialogue that's going on, then actually that dialogue they just stop it. You know, because they maintain their own level of safety and connection with the group so they don't want it poisoned you know for want of a better word yeah. Yeah. which was really a little bit about what was happening so at risk of going into a bit of jargon land um are we talking about you know setting some terms of reference and ground rules for the group so to enable people to feel safe and that could be in a in a more formal or an informal mm -hmm. way yeah. you know mm -hmm. is, is uh, having a kind of a contract if you like mm -hmm. agreeing amongst the group about you know what? What I, you need within the group to feel yeah. safe. I, I think that's 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 a good idea in principle. But if anybody's thinking of setting up a group, I wouldn't advise that that's the first thing you do. Hmm. Um, I think you know they should be informal social groups, um, for, for my money anyway. And um, and and if something begins to rustle a bit under the bed covers, so to speak. Sorry, that was an awful, <laughs> awful <laughs> metaphor. Um, if, if something um, happens to um, be seen to be going slightly wrong, um, then uh, I think that's the time to start introducing things like, you know, respect. Um, oh man, respect uh, mm. and all that. Thank you. Um, Danny, do you, have, do you have terms of reference or ground rules for your groups? Yeah, so we're a little bit more formal um, than perhaps George's group. Um, so we are set out like a business meeting. Each time that we meet, we have an agenda uh, of what we want, want to discuss. Don't get me wrong, it's not your typical formal business meeting. We have lots of giggles in between, but it does keep us on track for talking about all the different projects that they're involved in. Um, also, we only meet once a month in terms of the actual Sunshiners meeting. And then we have lots of spin-off meetings depending on what projects they're involved in at the time. So recently they've had um, a grant for the research project, the Dementia Inquirers project. So we've had plenty of sideline meetings looking at data and, and developing questionnaires and things like that. So ours are a little bit different. We do have terms of reference and we do have like a, a little sort of contracty thing that people sign. But that said, we don't, you know, it's not a matter of come along to our group, but you need to sign this before you can enter. Um, we enable people to come along for their first session with uh, a carer or a family member or whoever they want to come with if they wish to. They don't have to do that, of course. Um, they're not, we don't accept any carers after that point. So we are, are just for people with dementia. That said, it's actually created a really nice community uh, without meaning to. So mm. all of the carers now have one another on um, WhatsApp mm. 
and the yeah all the wives and husbands sort of text one another you'll find that quite often lots of members arrive together because there's quite a few of our members that are in similar areas so um you know it'll be I don't know John's wife who does the run this week and uh somebody else's husband might do the run next week mm. so it, it kind of gives gives people a bit of a break so that's that's been quite nice and actually the feedback from our sunshiners themselves have been that they feel that they're able to talk about things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to talk about at home because they're worried that these things that they they want to talk about or have noticed uh would upset people um and we find that by not having carers um or or family members um one thing that really does come from it you notice that if somebody comes along they'll they might be telling a story but they'll they'll correct them no that didn't happen on wednesday that happened on thursday no it wasn't the second it was the first well actually that's completely irrelevant to what this person is trying to say um so it stops that from happening and it just lets the person um feel empowered to talk about whatever they and they can tell us that it happened 16 years ago or they can tell us it happened yesterday it doesn't matter it for them it happened um and that's that's all we're interested in really um Mm. but yeah so yeah we are run a little bit differently go on george uh well i just wanted to to follow up a bit because i i mean i i'm very aware that every group is different and and each group depend what the way groups work together, I suppose, is always dependent upon who's in the group. So, yeah, you uh, and also, of course, as you said, just said, Danny, you, you there are a lot of projects going on down there. Um, so you need to have a, a little bit more structure to make sure that they are, let's say, coordinated. Whereas, you know, we've done a couple of inquiries projects, but it's been you know, quite ad hoc and um, and they've worked because one or two people have done them and um, and it hasn't needed a business-like approach. Uh, but I mean, I would be, I, I would hate a business approach. I would hate, you know, a chair and a secretary in terms of reference. It's just, that's what I don't like. So I wouldn't go to that group, but I would go to another group. I'd go to my own group. So, um, you know, uh, Horses for courses, I guess. Absolutely. And I think that's the beauty of the network, isn't it? The, the kind of how all the groups are completely individual. Yeah. The only the only thing that connects you are the, the kind of like those deep core values. Mm. And you can do do what you want in your group. Um, Damien. I, I suppose um, York Minds and Voices, but probably somewhere in between the two, you know, the, so there is that real blend of, you know, formalities. And um, we did write a constitution a couple of years ago, um, which was just a really nice exercise. You know, we're still on the journey to becoming, you know, some sort of recognized sort of formal group as such. So um, to have some sort of statutory relevance, I suppose. But um, yeah, the, the, the you know, it's but there's that general understanding, and I think George hinted at that, that general understanding, this is a group for people with dementia, this is a safe space for you to air your views. And and so the, we don't sort of stand there and here's all the terms of reference and here's the sort of a behavioral contract or anything like that. And I don't think anyone does really, but it, you know, <laughs> it's just generally understood. And maybe as Ruth hinted that the like-minded people will, will stay connected and will, stay coming yeah. to the group because yeah. they like it because this is a place i can flourish because i feel i can belong here because there's a welcome and that's probably one of the reasons why yeah we've not had really any any sort of big any any beefs really um i remember a, a, a family brought a chap in and we were welcoming him and everyone was interested in him and 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 his family around him were speaking over him and one of the sort of there was a friend of the family said to us, oh yes, but you like you you don't look like you've got dementia, the classic. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> so as as a as a facilitator, I, what would anyone like to uh, <laughs> respond to that? And um yeah, they didn't really come back again after that. <laughs> um Oh, which was a pity because we said, look, go away and have a cup of tea. And, you know, you're, you, the chap you brought, you know, he's very, very welcome to come along. But, um, 
you know, it was it was it was a pity we we didn't get to see yes. him again. But um, so sometimes there's missed opportunities. But yeah, the, 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 those shared values. If 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 there's there's a disparity there, as Ruth said, you know, people will move away. I think. Ruth. The, uh, I'm just, I've picked up something in the chat there that's probably quite helpful just to kind of touch on. I mean, one of the problems that we have in Fife is that some of our groups have very small numbers. And, you know, uh, people with dementia, in my experience, it's not the first thing that they look to do to come to a group. It can be real. I mean, even Irene would tell you herself that it wasn't, she didn't really want to do it. She came along because family were insisting and she thought, well, I'll just go and get it over with and I'll never go back. So there is a real hurdle about getting people to come to groups. Now, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I mean, we know that if people come and get something out of it and feel that they fit, they will stay. But for some people, it just doesn't work. And mm. I don't know how you provide them with peer support. I mean, you can maybe do it on a one-to-one, -one, and we've tried some of that. But I, I just I despair sometimes of the fact that people won't even try it. I mean, if somebody tries something and it's not quite right, then that's absolutely fine. And sometimes it's just the dynamics of the group on the day. But, you know, it is really hard to get people with dementia to come out to things really hard. Um, and if anybody's got a, a magic pill that would make that happen, then <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to disperse it. <laughs> yeah, that kind of ties into the whole thing of, of, of starting up a group and very often hear from people saying, well, where do you find these people with dementia who want to come part of these groups? Um, George and then Damien. Uh, uh, Damien was first, go on. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, there you are, Lord Damien. It was just, just in relation to the to the chat there that uh, Di had pointed out, um, she felt a bit uncomfortable uh, about, you know, maybe bad mouth and the care partners. Uh, I would say not at all. I, I think certainly in the reality, you know, that there are many care partners come to our, our group and there are many people with dementia, as, as I think Di mentioned, you just couldn't even imagine without their care partner coming along. They were very much a twosome. I'm thinking very much of Eric and Elaine in our group. And Elaine sadly died last year, but Eric still comes to the group. Mm -hmm. He's very much a member of, of the group um, as, as a former care partner, but he's still yeah. welcome to the group. And um, I, th I think, yeah, there's, there is a whole mix. And, you know, there are certainly people, you know, and care partners who are there. And I think that's the message we give as well is, you know, your role is, is very much to support the person you care for, you know, in their participation in the group. And, um, you know, and that, and, and that does does work well. You know, we, you know, it, it, I would hate to give the impression there's a constant battle between care partners yeah. and, and people with dementia. No, I mean, I, I agree entirely. There isn't um, that. I mean, we found that our, our carer halves um, tend to, they now form a wonderfully supportive group of their own. Um, and, and they're in touch with each other, like Damien's um, mentioned about some others. You know, they're, they're in touch with each other at different times. Um, and they don't mind at all when I say uh, during a meeting, so let's, let's have half an hour apart now. Um, you know, and um, it works fine. What I was going to say were about getting people to go and try groups is, firstly, we've we've agreed that groups are different, depending on who goes. And for me, that makes the argument that we should have a lot more groups, because then you're more likely to get a group to suit you if you keep trying. Secondly, I think it's really important that someone accompanies person the first time I mean it might be a member of the group goes and picks them up and collects them um, or it might be a, I mean this social prescribing thing I think is a fantastic um, approach but I do wish the social prescribers had the time to actually take people the first time because people with dementia when they're first going to a group I mean you know, you run a you run a big risk because I, I first one I went to wasn't a deep group. It was run by the local memory service, and it had sort of seventy to eighty year olds who were being fed fish and chips and could not have a conversation. And I had to, you know, I virtually ran out of the place. Um, and and there is that danger. You have to try and fit the person to the group. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think yeah. Take Thank people you. the first time, yeah. Um, as, as Damien said, it's horrible being new anyway, and I always 
hark back to um, a, a blog that Wendy Mitchell, who is part of um, York Minds and Voices, um, where she writes about meeting someone who was new coming into, and we talk about this in the facilitators' top tips booklet as well, is about ensuring that someone is always made to feel welcome. Yeah. And if it's another, but if it's a group member that is doing that welcoming, how important and powerful that is. Oh, yeah. you've got dementia as well, have you? Oh, yes, I've got that thing too, kind of thing. Danny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I wanted to go back and just touch again on uh, the the comment that was put in the group. I guess um, one thing that I I wanted to acknowledge about being quite unique to deep groups is how it builds people's confidence. Um, we've had a few people who have been in similar scenarios where after diagnosis didn't want to go anywhere without a partner. And of course, you know, we do have partners come along to the first session, maybe two if, if someone's really uncomfortable. Um, but more often than not, you find that uh, after a session or two, they're not talking to their partner anymore. They're kind of so immersed with everybody else um, that, that they become a bit more comfortable, which is really nice to see. Um, yeah, just wanted to kind of acknowledge that that, that I think is something that is quite unique to deep is is how it does build people's confidence and makes them realize that they they can do these things on their own sometimes and i and i think that i i might sound like a stuck record when i say we must never forget the experiences that people have had um up to leading up to a diagnosis and and being given this label of dementia being you know on a very kind of um a, a destructive pathway you know often and and you know people have talked a lot about hope this week and about how you know, hope is taken away but if hope was given at the point of diagnosis in terms of being have the education for both the person with dementia and the family members as well how valuable that would be and the good life with dementia course that Damon is, is involved with and Stan has delivered as well is so important in giving people a kind of um a pathway where they can choose to become you know involved and continue to come to a group or choose to opt out of it as well mm. um there's a question that i've noticed about the value of meeting online um as well as in person and i guess it harks back as, as well to um you know how how it's possible as a, as a coordinator to support a uk-wide network in that we have um I wonder if anybody wants to talk about the, the facilitators peer support that happens, which kind of mirrors, you know, what we want to see happening in groups, really. Um, how have you benefited from coming along to the facilitator Zooms for support? Anybody want to talk? Ruth? I mean, I, I've not been at the group for a long time now because when, as soon as we started to be able to meet face to face, my schedule just became too difficult to manage it. Certainly over the pandemic, I found it absolutely invaluable, um, just that kind of sense of finding out from other people, particularly people like George, who are living with dementia, who are facilitating a group. There was a huge amount that I could learn from their conversation and the kind of things that they were trying and stuff like that. It really made me see it from the perspective of the person with dementia, which I think I was probably doing, but just to have that kind of safe dialogue on screen, you know, was really, really helpful. Um, but they kind of just that kind of sense of because I think one of the things that you know it says in the the booklet is you know to make sure that you get support for yourself it can be quite a lonely job I mean I'm very lucky that you know Maggie and the nurse who supports people like Jerry and I and, you know she's around in Fife and we've got other projects that we work with so I've got a bunch of people quite easily to kind of link with but I probably get as much care and concern from Irene and Jerry as I do from them so you can use the group well to get that kind of sense of, you know, support and that you're not alone and things. But I certainly found these conversations invaluable because we were really just starting. I mean, we'd only started the stand group in the September 2019. You know, the pandemic hit in March 2020. We were really new and we're kind of making it up as we went along, really, to be perfectly honest. So, you know, from that point of view, that huge learning curve that came through the pandemic and these kind of conversations um, were really exceptionally helpful and we are where we are today because of all that kind of input and support that was available. 
Thank you. George. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, we, Riverside Group, did um, meet once a week and still are meeting once a week on Zoom. Um, and it's it's been it's been good. It's been useful. Um, there are weeks when people don't have much to say, and weeks when people have a lot to say. Mm. Um, and I must say, as facilitator, I find it quite challenging when it when people don't have much to say. Um, I find I have to cut. Well, I probably shouldn't, but I do try to keep filling the empty space. Um, my story in my life. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was going to say that one one guy in our group cannot use Zoom. He cannot, he just cannot use, it's not because he can't handle the, the actual technology. He cannot follow what's being said. Mm. Uh, so he can't use Teams, Zoom or anything else. He can't do it online. Uh, so for him, it's been quite a lonely experience. Um, and he's, he, he's, he's very thankful that um, we are now meeting in once a month face to face again. Before I come to Danny, I just wanted to ask you, George, as someone living with dementia, and um, about what you know, how important the support is for you with some of the things that happen within the group. How do you get your support for you in your role as facilitator? Well, well, luckily, luckily, I don't actually have to do very much. I mean, I just send send out emails uh, basically. Um, I I could be more. Well, Shropshire is just so far flung. Uh, the people who don't live reasonably close to to Shrewsbury, or who cannot drive, or yeah, or, or or if they cannot drive, then I'm afraid they're not going to get there, and I can't do much about that. Mm. But hopefully, very soon, and I'm hinting at Jackie here. Um, then hopefully, soon uh, that will be addressed because we'll have groups around the county. Um, mm. What did you say? I think I was thinking about kind of emotional support and psychological. Oh right, okay. Um, I think I probably, if I get any, it's from from meeting the deep people like yourselves online. Mm. Um, mm. As long as that goes on, then I'm, I, you know, I feel rejuvenated. Mm. Um, it's, it's. I don't find it, it extremely hard to do. That's all. Mm. Um, and I do have that. That I would call him my deputy. But or or co-chair, whatever, Clive. He he will always do things if if I can't uh, make it for some reason. Um, mm. And he and his wife are great at contacting people. Uh, and I mean, they they actually contact people who um, one or two people who have left the group because they they went downhill very fast. Um, and they keep in touch with them, which is more than I do. So mm. I I am not. <laughs> I do what I'm good at doing, let's put it that way. And I leave the other things to other people yeah. who are good at it. Thank you, George. And um, Danny. Yeah, I was just gonna touch on some of the facilitator sessions um, that were run on Zoom. And I personally found them a bit of a lifesaver. <laughs> I think because we were in the middle of COVID um, and our groups weren't allowed to meet, obviously being NHS, we also had to follow the guidance that the NHS were creating. So it meant that our group couldn't meet for longer than some other deep groups as well. Um, but we were, I'm quite pleased to say, we were the first group in Kent to make it online. Um, and that in its Itself came with several challenges because a lot of people hadn't had a computer throughout their life never needed one so actually this was completely new technology to some other people had really good um you know were, were really good at it and knew what they were doing but it took um quite a long time to sort of uh have one-to-ones with people and to try and support them on the telephone with how to access it and and what not else but I think once we got to Zoom I just expected it all to run smoothly <laughs> and it really didn't um, and so things like I want to speak cards um, were kind of talked about in the facilitators uh, groups and it kind of just enabled our meetings to run smoothly um, like George said a lot of our members reported that they didn't 
like to be on Zoom. They struggled with how long the meetings were. So we had to shorten our meetings because they were on Zoom. Um, but again, it was also difficult for them to follow conversation. Oh. Or um, change settings, perhaps unmute and remute. Are you with me? Yeah. We are back. Um, yeah, you're back. <laughs> Yeah, it's just saying um, it can be difficult for people to sort of know how to use the technology as well and mute and unmute. So, yeah, for me, the facilitator sessions really helped to find out what other groups do and how how we might be able to adapt. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, we've got some people who are heading off and um, we've, we're down to our last couple of minutes. Um, but uh, as Martin Gardner says, um, flexibility is absolutely the key. And um, uh, and also being free to sort of digress and go off um, off a bit on different directions. It always seems to happen in these meetings. Uh, George. Could I also say one thing? Uh, uh, when you're starting the group, uh, I think it's important not to panic when very few people turn up for a while. Uh, word does get round. I mean, you know, you do the obvious things like putting it in the local libraries and, you know, possibly even a doctor's surgery might take a note. Um, <laughs> mine doesn't, but some would. But, uh, but, um, but I think it's important just to wait. And Dory, of course, is the, the um, shining example of just waiting for nine <laughs> months in a pub until someone turns up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm... ah, good point, actually. Now, we should mention where we meet as well. Yes. Um... Find a nice social engagement place, if you possibly can, and which isn't course, too noisy. And of course, that is in the facilitator's top tip booklet as well. Um, so uh, we, we come into the new year, we will be re um, having regular facilitators meetings on Zoom, which bring facilitators across from all of the United Kingdom together to chew the cud and have discussions like this. So that is always available to facilitators or people who want to be facilitators, because of course anybody can set up a deep group, um, yeah. but uh, based on the deep values, most important thing. Um, thank you everybody who has uh, been listening to us behind in the background, and but particular thank you so much to, to Ruth, um, Damien, Danny and George, very much for your sharing your words of wisdom. And it, it's all, all about um, sharing, learning and supporting and, um, you know, and everyone who, who uh, is part of the Deep Network, it feels like everybody's very happy to share.